Well, hello, my name is Jeff Spears. Okay, Spears? Yes. Sir. From where? I'm from Florida. I'm from Lakeland, Florida. Okay, is it Spears in some places is an Indian name, you know. Yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm one quarter Cherokee. Okay, well, that, 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 I recognize that. My family name is Blackfeather. I understand that you have written some books and uh, very knowledgeable of like the, about the Black Seminoles uh, interactions and everything. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I'm, I consider myself a student of all of this, and uh, I do uh, Native American history at uh, SUNY New Paltz, uh, that's State University of New York in New Paltz, New York, uh, teach Native American history. Oh, excellent. Uh, so I, I do basically uh, Southeastern uh, peoples and the Black Seminoles are a component of that uh, mix of uh, Southeastern tribes. Very good, very good. Well, um, can you tell me the, the basically the history of how the, the black slaves inter became oh, yeah, sure. black Seminoles? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, uh, history. Uh, most of the emphasis is on the, those that escaped the plantations and came directly to the Seminoles. But there's another uh, tradition of Maroons. There was one big uh, Maroon uh, area in the Great Dismal Swamp, which is on the border of Virginia and North Carolina. People were escaping into the swamp, Indians and uh, slaves, white debtors, and uh, anybody who wanted to avoid the law would go into the Great Dismal Swamp and make a life for themselves. Then there were other Maroon uh, communities. The ones that we're most interested in were in the western part of North and South Carolina. And when they were disbanded by the regulators, they fled south into Creek country. Now the Creek town of Chiaha uh, was noted for receiving a lot of uh, these people. The governor at the time was complaining that so many slaves were going into Chiaha that is becoming a, a maroon uh, refuge. And the word that you find in the literature is banditi. Uh, they were referred to as banditi. And the Chiahas then, in time, came down into Florida and became a new group called the Miccosukis. Okay. And, and these were Hichiti speaking as opposed to Muscogee proper speaking. So within the Creek Confederacy, which was sort of a United Nations, you had all different peoples, had all different ethnicities, you had many different languages. It was almost like a Tower of Babel uh, because of the sheer diversity of people. And they drifted to um, Florida uh, because the uh, Appalachian people uh, in this area, and not in this area, but in the panhandle around the Appalachicola area, who had been missionized by the Spanish and then victimized by the South Carolinians who came in and just broke their power, uh, took away many of them in slaves. People don't realize the extent of Indian slavery, and I'm doing a special study on the extent of Indian slavery and how big Indian slavery was. Uh, in fact, when Bartram came to uh, interview uh, Chief uh, the Cowkeeper, he remarked that the slaves that Cowkeeper had were all Yamasee Indians. So when you see slaves, the assumption is that they were automatically African. And in fact, they could have been African, they could have been Indian, and to the dismay of a lot of people, they were actually white. Because we have a famous case of a German girl being taken into slavery in Louisiana. And people are marvelous as well. How can a German be uh, mistaken for Negro? And the explanation is simple. Not all Germans were blonde and blue-eyed. Uh, some Germans were swarthy in complexion, dark-haired, dark-complected. And also because of the one-drop rule that says that if one drop of Negro blood made you all Negro, which is ridiculous, because if you took a pot of white coffee, uh, white milk, and dropped a put a drop of coffee in it, what would you have? Would you have coffee or would you have milk? So the one drop rule uh, scientifically was ridiculously, was ridiculous, but for political reasons, for caste reasons, it was very functional because it enlarged the enslavable people. So on any, any slave plantation, you would have people 
looking the full range from blonde and blue eyes. Uh, we go to Thomas in Jefferson's case, for instance, and, and Sally um, Hemings. Uh, Sally Hemings, they refer to as the dusty Sally Hemings. Well, the visitors often remarked that she looked remarkably like Jefferson's first wife. Well, that makes sense because that was her half-sister. Huh. Okay? And because, they, because of the one-drop rule, they always think of her as being black, but she, she was probably only one-eighth uh, of African ancestry. And the proof of it is so many of her children just disappeared in, into the white world. So when you have these people coming down and the amount of slaveries that, slaves that the Indian nations had, and um, these people became integrated into the particular tribes, and they filtered down. So that's one stream of uh, people of African ancestry being absorbed into the uh, uh, Indian nations. Then you had those coming more recently, uh, and they were separate. See, the key in Indian society at the time was the maternal uh, descent. So if you had a black man marrying an Indian woman, the children would all be the Seminole because they would have a clan. If his sister married a Seminole man, his children would not have the clan and they would be black. So you have first cousins, who well, some would be fully Seminole and the others would be black. So you had you have to deal with all this, this mixture. And when you were asking questions about numbers, well, it's hard to give numbers because in practicality, it was hard to distinguish who was who because of the amount of, uh, of racial mixture that took place. Now, what they did in uh, later years at Fort Brooke to distinguish the uh, black Seminoles, those who were Indianized from the more recent arrivals, was by language. So those who spoke the language were assumed to be Seminoles, and those who didn't speak the Seminole languages were considered not to be Seminole. I see. And so it, it's a quite interesting story because it's not clear. The, all the lines are blurred. And so you have a lot of generalizations that really don't stand up under very close scrutiny. It's funny, as you, as you mentioned, the, um, uh, the separation from if you are, if you are a female married yeah. to male married, it, it, uh, it dawned on me. I guess there were politics in the Indian uh, realm also. Yes, yeah, certainly. See, it makes more sense that a child should follow the, the mother's sta uh, status. Uh, because if you look at the Western society, it, it's the paternal and paternalistic side that, you know, the, 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 uh, the man is the lord of his castle, and so he owns the women and children. Uh, Native society was a little bit different. They had gendered uh, domains. The domain of the men were the woods and the outside. They would do the hunting, they would do the fighting, they would do the diplomacy. But in the camp, when you come into the camp circle, that was all female dominated. And so when the men came back from war, they had to go through purification to clear their hands of the blood that they might have spilled so they wouldn't bring the violence in, in, into the to camp. the home. Exactly. And there's an old adage that uh, when a child is born, it's mama's baby, daddy's maybe. <laughs> okay, and because of the kind of life, uh, a woman may have had several husbands because men were very uh, uh, vulnerable to being killed on the trail and what have you. And, and the woman would have the children, and even if the children had different fathers, they would be accepted by the clan and they wouldn't make any distinction. See, a good mother doesn't make any distinction among her children uh, because of who the father is. They're all equally her children. Correct. Okay, and so, and she's the one that teaches them, the first teacher, and it's her brothers who are the male figures that teach the boys because her brothers belong to the clan and only the brothers have the clan knowledge. The father is of a different clan and he has the knowledge of his clan and his duty uh, is to his sister's children. So the man is sort of a, a guest uh, in, in, the, in his, his wife's uh, camp, for instance. And so you take care of the question of, uh, of domestic violence, don't you? 
because if you're a man and you're living with your wife and her brothers are all around, you think twice be, uh, before you get abusive, <laughs> uh, okay? And so it, the, the system had a, a lot of built-in uh, safeguards that it developed over many periods of years. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm glad that you touched on that because I wanted to ask you, what was the, um, in, in other words, in, in other countries, uh, women are not on an equal status right. uh, throughout history. Right. And how was it with the Indians? How was, was the woman, um, was she on equal status? Was she even on a higher status? What okay. was a woman's status well, in it, the it, clan? It, it, it varied uh, across the, um, across what is the, now the United States. In the Eastern area, uh, the, the women had, had a lot of say because they produced the food, okay? Uh, most of the calories, uh, see, one of the things they said about the native people was they were only stragglers, they were wanderers, uh, they were hunters and gatherers. Well, that wasn't strictly true. They had, they had, they grew their crops, the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. And so the women provided the majority of the calories. The men hunted and they brought in meat and the hides, but it was the, the women. And so by controlling the food, because the camp, the fields, belonged to the, the women. And so they had a lot to say. And when you write treaties and what have you, uh, the women have a lot to say about the treaties because it's their fields, it's their homes. And so in, in the eastern part of the, the country, the women had a stronger position. Now if you go out west on the plains where there are buffalo hunters, see the men are almost totally responsible for the source of food because they live basically on, on the buffalo and would trade only occasionally for a little corn, a little tobacco or something like that. So it depends on the economic balance, as it were, in the society and who was providing the, the greatest amount of substance. Uh, in some places uh, in the Northeast, the men couldn't go to war unless the women said it was okay, which makes sense because in war, a man could go and he gets killed and that's the end of his story. But the women and children, they have to live with the aftermath. And so they could be sold into slavery, they could be killed, or what have you. So this decision to go to war, the decision to uh, sell land, the women would be most directly impacted and, and, and their children. And so therefore they had a large say on what was, what was to be done. When, uh, let's say, uh, the, the the male and the female, they, they live a long life. Did Was there divorce? Was there oh, yeah. any kind of separation oh, yeah. or anything it, it, like it, it, that? In, easy, easy. Uh, when a woman had enough, she just puts your stuff at the door and you're gone. Wow, not a lot has changed. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the old no, saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and so it, it, it made a, a lot of sense that, okay, you can't get along, well, you, well that's it. Uh, you know, no fuss, no muss. Wow. Well, I wish it was that simple today. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but of course, you know, I'd have my stuff sitting out of many teepees at this well, point. Well, well, that might work to your advantage. <laughs> <laughs> you could sample many soups. <laughs> uh, very good. Very good. I like that. I like that. Are you familiar with, um, I, I've done some reading and research, and... Well, you could pick up that book there, see, the invisible. You just pick that up. And you just flip to page 191. I've got it done. Looks familiar. Okay. <laughs> is this your book? Well, this, no, this is a, a book in the, which I was included. It's part of an exhibit by the National M Museum of the American Indian. And so I've been on a speaking tour in, in, with them, uh, talking about the various things. And I last book about the extent of Indian slavery, because that's such an uh, important topic. As you know, a lot of... Uh, African Americans uh, claim Indian heritage and they've been poo pooed, saying, oh, that can't happen. Well, if you understand Indian slavery, you see that it's, it's very plausible and it's hardly, it's hardly deniable. I understand that a lot of Indian slaves actually left Florida, or Indians actually left Florida fleeing the slave trade exactly. and went to Cuba. 
That's and right. many of the other outlying islands. That's right. Now, Dr. Howard was sometimes here. She has traced them to the um, Bahamas, the place called Red Bay's Andros Island in the Bahamas. But when the slave traders came down, they grabbed anybody they could get. And, and, and it was another body uh, worth another chilling, uh, I guess, I huh? Because there was uh, Andrew Jackson in the First Creek War, the town of uh, uh, Tallahatchie, which was a northern Creek town, he sent 84 Creek women and children back to his plantation, the Hermitage, for safekeeping. Wasn't that nice? For safekeeping. And, and so, and you had a, a General Wellburn uh, out of Georgia. He was grabbing people left and right. Uh, after the end of the Second Seminole War, we've got documentations of people who were held on plantations and the owners would not let them go because they were using them as laborers. And so the, all, all this stuff needs to, to, to be brought out. In our own case, my family's case, uh, uh, we, we are connected to two Indian agents. That was, uh, one was James Bullock, who took some creeks back with him to North Carolina and settled on the Nutbush Creek. And that's the community that my mother comes from. Uh, Benjamin Hawkins, who was the long-serving Creek Indian agent, is also c connected to our family. Uh, Richard Henderson, Judge Richard Henderson, he's also connected to our family. During the Seminole War, one of his descendants, Archibald Henderson, was a colonel in the Marines, and he was down here, and he wrote a book. So uh, my family is all involved in this area, all over the place through well-known well -known people. Well, very good. Well, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed my Thank conversation you. with you today.